Amen. Brother Donnie was preaching Wednesday night. Couldn't help but think of that song. I'm so glad I'm in this church. Not that church, this church. Amen. This church here. Amen. Thank God. What a wonderful message. Amen. I know everybody was sitting on pins and needles waiting on what Brother Donnie was going into since he finished up the book of Acts. But amen. What a great, amen. What a great way to kick off a new series. Amen. Aren't you so glad tonight? Amen. Let's just turn around and shake somebody's hand. Tell them it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Let's just sing a little more of that. Amen. This evening. When I'm in this church. It's a glorious church. Oh, I did not join. I was born. I've had a new birth. Some glorious day. Oh, gonna sail away. It's by His grace, not by my works. I'm in this church. Oh, I'm in this church. It's a glorious church. Oh, I did not join, oh, I was born, I've had a new birth, some glorious day, oh, I'm gonna sail away, by His grace, not by my works, I'm in this church, oh, sing it to Him tonight, I'm in this church, it's a glorious church. I did not join, though I was born, I had a new birth, some glorious day, I'm going to sail away, it's by His grace, not by my works, oh, sing it one more time, oh, I Sail away by His grace, not by my works. I'm in His church. Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. Amen. We'll look at the prayer request this evening. Amen. Want to please pray for uh, Brother Frank Williams. Had some oral surgery uh, done this past week. In a lot of pain, they had to cut his gums, put stitches there uh, where he'd been cut on. Uh, so we certainly want to remember that need. Sister Martha Ann had turned that in tonight, so we want to remember that request. I uh, want to continue to remember uh, Sister Donna Pistole uh, had surgery on her foot, uh, not going to be able to walk on it for several weeks. Ask prayer for complete recovery. Amen. I know the Lord's mindful. Amen. He's certainly able. Also, I uh, want to please pray for Tiffany Woodfin. Uh, has gone to the hospital with uh, lower stomach pain, so they've asked for the church to pray. Uh, Brother Tony McGraw has asked the church to remember his grandmother. Uh, they've sent her home uh, with hospice care. Uh, please pray for him and the family as they're traveling to see her. So we certainly want to remember uh, Brother Tony's grandmother there and the family there. Also, uh, Brother Robert Marrero had called uh, before service this evening, ask the church to please remember him in prayer. He's going to see a heart specialist on Monday and just has asked for the church to please be in prayer for him. Amen. So we certainly want to lift him up in our prayers. Also, I want to please pray for Ernest Oliver. Uh, this is Brother Lance's, Lance Parker's grandfather in Louisiana. Uh, he's in the ICU with pneumonia, urinary tract infection, and now heart failure. Really needs a touch from the Lord, so let's just remember Brother Lance's uh, grandfather this evening. Also, want to please pray for Brother Keith Strader's dad. Uh, he's doing better, um, but they're doing more tests on his lungs and heart. So we certainly want to remember uh, that request before the Lord this evening. Amen. How many has a need upon your heart tonight? Amen. As we stand, Amen. Brother Terry, would you come take the request before the Lord for us? Amen. I think it's a real privilege to be here tonight. Amen. You agree with that? Amen. Three times a week we get, we get, we get to come to the house of the Lord. This will be the best part of our day. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we come before you, that's not just a word or some cliche. That's truly from our hearts. 
we're truly blessed to get to come to church. It won't always be this way. We know that. As time begins to diminish, gets closer and closer to that diminishing point, Lord God, we know that these things will, will come upon us because the prophets done told us, but we're so thankful, so thankful that we have one more opportunity to come and learn of your word and worship you in spirit and in truth and bring before you, Lord, these requests and talk to you and have fellowship with you and, and understand you Lord, and see more of the mighty God unveiled before us. Lord, it's a, it's a great love affair that we have heard so wonderfully about with the Song of Solomon and that wonderful relationship type in us. Lord Jesus, how thankful we are. Now, I pray for these requests. Lord, I, I pray that you'll be with Brother Frank. You know the need there, and I ask that you'll just undertake in his behalf. And we understand Brother Marrero, he has a, a, perhaps maybe even a heart condition going to see a, a heart doctor. I pray, God, that you'll give him a good report. Lord, if there be anything there at this present moment that would be of, of ill report, take it away. Make him altogether new. We just pray, Lord, in each one of these requests that I hold in my hand. Lord, they're dear to you. They're precious to you. And I pray as our brother comes and, and uh, ministers the word tonight that you would anoint him to speak. We know the word's already anointed. and on our ears to hear. And, Lord, we know that we just can join our faith. And if you'll join your faith with our faith, it'll make it perfect faith. And then we can see things happen and come to pass as we desire them to be. And, Lord God, we're happy, so happy, as I said earlier, to be part of the great kingdom of God. Lord, to be part of this end time message, to be able to receive present day truth, to have an ear to hear, to have a desire to come to the house of God. Lord, even that you chose us before the foundation of the world. Lord, we, we weren't looking for you, but you were looking for us. I'm thankful, dear God, you came looking for me. How I've loved you these past 42, 3, 4 years that I've been saved, dear God, it's just been a, a glorious journey this far. And how, just the beginning of an eternal journey. We're so happy for it. Lord, touch each one of these requests I hold in my hand. Let it be a testimony, Lord, that you're still with us. There's faith in the building. Somebody's going to receive their healing tonight. Touch maybe even a new birth. Whatever it might be, bring to us, Lord, the word of the Lord. and Give us grace tonight. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this song tonight. When the reason that I'm standing stands in front of me. Amen. I'm telling you, on that day when we get there, we could stand for a million years and praise him for 24 hours, seven days a week, and never thank him enough for what he's done for us. Amen. He's just been so good to us in our lives. Amen. There's no way we could ever thank him or ever repay him. Amen. For what he's done for us. Oh, I have stood for the gospel. When it seemed I stood alone But through the heartache and frustration I kept my focus on the throne Oh, so many times I have recalled The Savior's words so true and You won't be ashamed of me Then I won't be of you and So I'll proud until I see Oh, the face of the one who gave Everything for me Oh, and the reason that I'm standing Stands in front of me Oh, every battle that I fought Will fade from memory Circumstances all around me. I thought I'd surely fall when the whispering of doubt and fear told me you would lose it all. I guess, but he kept me with his amazing grace. And someday soon I'll have the 
sing that little chorus. Didn't I walk on the water? Didn't I calm the raging seas? Amen. I stood right beside you. Mm. As I kneel in the darkness in the middle of the night I'm praying for assurance everything's gonna be alright Lord I see another battle out in front of me I'm afraid I won't be able and I'll go down in defeat when he said I walked on the water and I calmed the rage you see I spoke to the wind in a house that was once a home. She said, my bills are coming due, Lord, six 
days is not that long She hears a voice so still and low Says I moved like that before I'll do this little thing for you But I'll give you so much more Oh, and he said I Something keeps holding me Every day I see Brother Joel Brown Be faithful be Oh, 
Jesus is holding me. Yes. Amen. I realized that a long time ago. I would have given up. I would have turned around, went the other way. But something kept holding me. Yes. Prophet of God one day said he almost turned around, went the other way. Said he was just about to say, if you won't, t- if you won't heal my baby, Lord, I won't even serve you. But he said something way down on the inside. <laughs> I tell you what, it was beyond his senses. It was beyond his emotion. It was way down in that soul realm. 
Amen. The Apostle Paul said it this way. We have an anchor hidden behind the veil. Steadfast. Are you glad it's steadfast? And it's sure. When in an age and a world that we live where nothing's sure, we have an anchor. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it's so good to be here in the house of the Lord. Amen. With you. God bless you again. Amen. Feel like I was just here. Amen. Just a few weeks ago, so uh, no need for any kind of, uh, you know, uh, introduction or anything like that. I'm just going to pretend I'm at home. I'm just going to preach. Amen. Got to go straight to the Word. Praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Thank you for all that. Amen. Good singing and music. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Harry, good to see you. I guess you got the memo. I won't come here and preach unless you're here. <laughs> Oh, I'm just kidding. I, I told him I was going to tell Brother Donnie that last time, that unless Brother Harry's there, I'm just not coming. Sorry. <laughs> amen. Certainly, all, everybody's just a blessing to see, amen, friends and those that we've come to know. Amen. So glad that Jesus is here. Amen. And I'm glad that he's comfortable. Amen. amen. I'm comfortable when the Lord is comfortable. Amen. amen. So glad that he's here. Joshua chapter 7, we'll go straight to the word tonight. Amen. Joshua chapter 7. We'd like to preach to you on struggling to live. Amen. Struggling to live. Joshua chapter 7. And we'd like to just go this direction here tonight and uh, continue in the same thought tomorrow morning if the Lord would let us. Amen. And we just came with something burning upon our heart. Just preached this uh, just one time just here recently uh, at home. And so just still felt the, the, the burden of the Lord just to continue. Amen. I just believe he has something for us. Struggling to live, Joshua chapter 7. You know they have a saying that says the struggle is real. Amen. And it is. They didn't know when they made that phrase how true it was. I don't care how much victory you have or how much defeat, how, how victorious you are, how much of a revival you feel like you're in right now, you are in the middle of the greatest struggle of your life. Amen. When you are a born-again believer, you come like the Apostle Paul in Romans 9, and Paul said, I realized I'm in a struggle. I've got, two, I've got a law within my members warring against my flesh. I have a will of the Spirit of, uh, that wants to do one thing, but I have a flesh that fights against it every single day. Amen. But God says uh, this is exactly how life will come through a struggle. Amen. Joshua chapter 7. It's a lengthy reading. We'll cover some of it and have you be seated. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. This word accursed means banned. That word banned means curse. They committed a, a, a trespass in the banned thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is behind, beside beth -Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. First mistake. They just came out of a great victory over a walled city. The impossible. They just, they just had victory uh, over Jericho. Now they come to this little puny city, and they say, you know, we don't need to send everybody. Don't need to really go prayed up. You know, don't really need to go consecrated like we were for Jericho. It's just a little thing. You know, just a little city. First mistake of the victorious Christian. After victory, we overestimate our own human ability. And we underestimate our enemy. Notice here, and this was a mistake by Joshua, not just Achan. This is going to be about Achan, but this is also going to be about the failure of Joshua to discern sin in the camp. Notice what it says here. So there went up thither 
Verse 4, of the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Chabarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore, the hearts of the people that were on fire and in revival and shouting now melt. Notice it says, therefore the people's hearts, the people melted and became as water. And Joshua ripped his clothes, rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord, even unto the evening tide, he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan? To deliver us into the hand of the Amorites? To destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side. Read your Bible again. This, 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 isn't, a, this isn't a heathen saying this. This is Joshua. This is the victorious mighty conqueror, the leader of Israel. And he says, Would, we might as well have just stayed on the other side of the Jordan. Notice he says here in verse 8, O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall emberon us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do unto thy great name? The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. (laughs) Wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and assembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're here. We thank you, Lord, that your name is one that we can depend upon. It's a mighty and strong tower, Lord, that the righteous can run into and be safe. Lord, you've gathered us here, Lord, by divine appointment here tonight on this Saturday evening service, Lord. Father, you've put words and a burden upon a minister's heart. Lord, and I just have one desire, to get myself out of the way, Lord, so that you could use me to speak to your children. Father, I went through many different things, many Uh, Lord, thoughts that you've given me, Father, and studied and went over many different directions I could go, but just felt, Lord, your leading of your Spirit pulling me in this direction. Father, may your people, may me as the minister, Lord, move ourselves out of the way and just be sensitive to the voice of the Lord. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. After such a great victory at Jericho, chapter 7 is surprising to say the least when you read such a defeat. And through this, men are going to die, 36 men, I believe the scripture said. It's the only only record of men dying in Joshua. It's the only defeat recorded. It's going to come in this chapter 7. The book of Joshua is going to span 40 years and it's going to be Joshua's life from the time that he's 80 until the time that he's 120. The same way that Deuteronomy covers just 40 years of Moses' life from the time he's 80 till the time he's 120. And you find this great victory after Jericho and this great rejoicing after they come and conquer this great walled city. And you come to this striking account of disobedience and lack of discernment, lack of prayer, lack of consulting the Lord, and just a haphazardness just to go forward. You know, we almost have a tendency to believe that one victory ensures or guarantees the next. But how many times have we fallen flat on our face? after the greatest spiritual experience, only to be in despair and disgust at our own human fallen nature. Many times God will let us get to a place of spiritual pride and we think something of ourself only to pull the rug out from under us when we fall down flat and go, am I even born again in the first place? 
The Bible says here in verse 13, notice this when God talks to Joshua, and we'll just cover this lengthy reading and then move on uh, and cover it back, come back to it. It says here in verse 12 uh, and verse, uh, verse 11, pick it up where it says, For they have even taken of the accursed thing. Verse 12, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Amen. Up. He says it again. Get up. Sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves again tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou cannot stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord hold, which and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. Joshua wakes up early. The next morning brings Israel by their tribes. We know the story. And he brings them through the, and he takes the family of Judah. And in this tribe, he took the family of the Zerites. And he brought them man by man. And the Bible says Zabdi was taken. And he brings and he comes to Achan. And Joshua says in verse 19, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Tell me now what thou hast done, hide it not from me. And Achan answered and said to Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold, 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth. Notice what he's going to say here. They're hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. The earth and the tent, two verbs or two words that is used by the Apostle Paul also when he speaks of earth saying that behold, the treasure is hidden in an earthen vessel. And the tent speaks of this own mortal flesh that we live in today that robes our soul. So the scripture is saying here, Achan says, I hid it in my tent within the earth. So this sin that he brings is a secret sin. It's something that can't be discerned from the outside by looking at him because he looks like any other message believer. He looks like any other soldier. He looked like he was just another one who went marching out of Jericho and clapping his hands and praising the Lord for victory. To, to the outside, he looked like everybody else. But in the earthen vessel, under the tent, in his heart, he was hiding something from God. And the scripture says here in verse 22, So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. They took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, unto the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And notice what it says here with Joshua. He brings all of his family, all of his possessions, his oxen, and every, all of his, his, his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and everything he had. In verse 25, Joshua says, Why has thou troubled us? Notice what Achan's name means. In fact, it's interesting the play on words that the Scripture uses here in Joshua. But Achan's name actually means trouble. That's what his name means. Achan means trouble trouble or distress and so joshua is going to say why has thou troubled us trouble <laughs> thou the lord shall trouble thee this day and all israel stoned him with stones burning with fire for they'd stoned with the stones they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day so the lord turned from the fierceness of his anger whereof the name of the place was called the valley of trouble acor Achan. that's what it means and so we see this great defeat after such a great victory. 
God is going to bring them in a transition here in Joshua. God is going to bring these people through, through the wilderness out of Egypt. And God is just doing mighty miracles. We know the stories after they come out through plagues. And God sends signs and wonders and brings them out of Egypt. And He's leading them by a mighty hand and through a prophet. And there's manna that's falling uh, every day. And they're eating quail in the morning. It just seems like God is just doing everything for them. He's going before them and preparing the way and, 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 and not knocking down walls and doors and fighting their battles. And this is the transition from Egypt into Canaan. But now when Canaan, when it comes time to Canaan, God is going to stop the manna. He's going to end the quail. He's going to take the spoon out of their mouth and He's going to say, now it's time for you to put action to your own faith. Because Canaan is not going to just be given to you, but you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to struggle. You're going to have to war. You're going to have to wage. If you have a desire to take what's rightfully yours, you've got to be willing to fight. Amen. Prophet of God says this about Canaan, and, and if they have that, you can put this uh, up on the, on the screen if you have it. It's, not, it's fine if you don't. The land was provided and divvied up by inspiration and each one. I could take the scriptures and show it to you exactly. He put them in the place where they were supposed to be positionally. How that the true two half tribes was to stay across the river. How that their mothers cried in their birth. And how that each place was supposed to be. And now, after you are in, that don't mean that you're out free from war. You still have to fight for every inch of ground you stand on. Now notice what the prophet says. You don't just have to fight for everything you want. But sometimes the battle for the believer is not gaining new victory or new ground. But it's holding the ground that you personally and presently hold. And you've got to say, Lord, I want to fight not just for new territory, but sometimes you're waging a war just to maintain your position in Jesus Christ. The prophet of God says you have to fight for every inch of ground you stand on. So Canaan did not represent the great heaven because it's war and troubles and killings and fightings and so forth. But it did represent this, that it must be a perfect walk you notice this pattern and this theme throughout the scripture you'll find it laced all the way from Genesis through Revelation and we don't have time to go that far but we'll bring out a few you'll find this theme uh, or this, this tenor this narrative of, of, of struggle and we find it even from the very first uh, through Jacob and Esau, the Bible says that Jacob in the womb grabbed his brother by the hill. That's what the scripture says. That even as a baby inside of the womb, he grabbed his brother by the hill. And what was the scripture showing? That, that there was something in Jacob that he, he, he was a fighter. He wanted to possess what, what was rightfully his. He wasn't going to be a pushover like Esau and just settle for a bowl of soup. But Jacob was showing even in the womb of a believer, when you are born again into the family of God, there's something about you that says, I, I don't want to be a pushover and just sitting on the bleacher somewhere cheering on, but I want to fight for every inch of ground that God has given me. I want to struggle. I want to fight for what God has rightfully given me as mine. And God has given you rights in the inheritance in the land. How many have read back in Deuteronomy 1 where the spies went right in there and tasted the things from Canaan, which Canaan is not a type of the millennium? How many knows that? Canaan is a type. Canaan is not a type of millennium because there were wars, fightings, killings, everything else in Canaan. Canaan is a type of the Holy Ghost. Egypt is the world that they come out of. The wilderness is where they were sanctified, called out, church. Canaan is where they settled down with the Holy Spirit because they still had war. And if you don't believe you have wars, just get the Holy Spirit. <laughs> They were possessing. What were they doing in Canaan? 
They were possessing their rights. Glory. They were possessing their rights. They could not possess their rights till they got into Canaan. They didn't own nothing in the wilderness. Then when they come into Canaan, they had rights. And we've got rights. And you've got rights. When you receive the Holy Ghost... You're in Canaan. Yes, sir. That's the reason people say, Brother Branham, you pray for me today. See, get over into Canaan once, brother, and you realize where you belong. Watch, prayer, start, things yonder. He said, look here, Satan, this is mine. I'm a possessor of this. Satan, God said, move out. Move off my ground. Your ground, Satan says, that's right. I've got an abstract deed to it. Move out, devil. I'll serve notice on you by the Holy Spirit's guidance. And Brother Branham says, and the devil has to move out. Remember, he even gave them the land, but they had to fight for every inch of it. God told him, everywhere the soles of your feet sets, that I've given you footsteps mean possession. Now you say, then the promise is mine. Sure, the promise is mine, but you'll fight every inch of it. Till you're well. You'll take every step. It's a battle. The promise is yours. That promised land was theirs. But they had to fight to get every inch of ground. They had to fight. And the promise is yours. But you'll fight every inch of it. Brother Branham, he says here, Brother Branham says here, you have to fight for every inch of ground. You say, Brother Branham, I was called of God to preach the Bible, uh, to preach the gospel. I fought every inch and every inch of ground. I fought with the sword of God, taking the promise and cutting away. The Apostle Paul says this here, and, and that you have this, brothers, if you want to put in 1 Timothy 6, 12, He says, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Struggle the good fight. Stop fighting the bad fight of sin. Stop fighting the losing fight of the world. It's just a losing battle. It's just a rat race. There's no purpose in it. But Paul says, fight the good fight. Lay hold. You know what that that word lay hold means? Paul Paul says it this way. Lay hold on eternal life. He says you've got to reach out and you've got to grab it. You've got to take it away. It speaks of violence. That's exactly what the scripture is saying here. It speaks of violence. That the kingdom of God suffereth violence. And the violent, that's you, that's me. Take it by force. Take our promises by forth, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Paul says here in 2 Timothy 4, I have fought a good fight. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, and here's the victory. I kept the faith. What is Paul saying? It wasn't a bed of roses for me. It wasn't easy every single day. I didn't walk into the church every single time. And every day I woke up with a big smile on my face. But I was struggling to fight. I was struggling to serve God. But I kept the faith. I fought the good fight of faith. I was shipwrecked three times. I was beat and stoned and kicked out of cities. Paul could say, I was forsaken on every side. I was forsaken by my brothers. What's he saying? My brother, as a good soldier in the army of the Lord, fight the good fight of faith. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. It wasn't always easy. In fact, most of the time it was difficult. It wasn't always a bed of roses. In fact, most of the time it was struggling. In fact, most of the time it was fighting. But here's the, here's the victory. Here's my testimony. Through it all, I kept the faith. I held on to the faith. But the Bible says that many let go. They cast off their faith. They cast aside and have been made shipwrecked because they cast aside their faith. 
But Paul says here in Hebrews chapter 11, speaking of the heroes of faith, they quench the violence of fire. They escape the edge of the sword and out of weakness were made strong. You hear about Rahab. You hear about all these heroes of faith. You hear about Joshua. You read that hall of fame in Hebrews 11. And you read how that Abel by faith and Moses by faith. And you get excited and say, oh, what a hero. What a mighty man David was. What a mighty man. What a mighty woman Rahab was. What a mighty uh, uh, judge, Deborah and Barak, as the scripture goes on to say. All of these people were mighty heroes of the faith. But brother, here's what you'll learn about those heroes. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. The heroes were fighters. They were people who struggled. And there's one thing that you'll learn that everything you get from God is a struggle. It's a fight. You're not just giving it on a silver platter. You're not just giving it and spoon fed it. But you've got to have something in you to say, I'm willing to fight for what God has promised me. I'm willing to fight and struggle for the promise of God. You say, I want the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God takes it by force. Even your prayer, even prayer is a struggle. The Bible says in James 5 verse 16, the effectual, fervent prayer. Not the little poem and the little pretty saying that you say. But he's saying if you want prevailing prayer, how many wants effectual prayer? Prayer that has an effect. What is effectual prayer? Prayer that works. Prayer that has an effect. Prayer that changes things. And it's not just a prayer that you pray in a pretty prayer. But it's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Availeth much. Oh, my brother, do you know what it means to labor in prayer? Oh, in the day and age we live in, no one wants to do that anymore. Everyone wants to just say a little prayer before they go to bed. Pray when they come to church on Wednesday and on Saturday and on Sunday. But a real prayer warrior knows what it means to get on their knees and struggle and have an effectual fervency to their prayer. Oh, my brother, that's the kind of prayer that you need in your life. It's the prevailing prayer. The struggling prayer. In fact, Paul goes further to say that a real struggle in prayer, that sometimes the prayer is such a struggle you don't even have words. When we know what not all we should pray. But don't worry. There's a promise. When you don't have words, the Spirit makes intercession. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual, fervent prayer. Prayer, the struggle, the struggle, as we said, is real. The struggle that Jacob felt, even in the womb, it was showing he was a man who was going to struggle for what he had, for what he could get. He was going to fight for what God had given him. He wasn't going to be satisfied and content just to let somebody do it for him or just hope that it fell on his lap or just hope that maybe he got lucky. But Jacob said, I've got a promise in the Word of God, in the Holy Ghost. I've been given a right and I'm willing to fight for my right. I'm willing to fight for my promises. I'm willing to fight for the promises of God. It's a fight. It's a struggle. And it's real. There's coming a day though when the struggle ends. It's amazing that through this, even after Joshua comes through this land and he comes and they come under this great conquest through Jericho. And there's this great victory, this great, overwhelming, exhilarating revival and shouting, no doubt, as God has just done the impossible. But let me say this to you, my brother and my sister. Joshua was going to conquer Canaan, 
but he was going to have to do it the way God told him to. He couldn't just go and face and say, you know, I'm looking at this map and over here is, is the land of the Canaanites and over here is the Jebusites and over here is the, you know, the Hittites and the Perizzites. And I think, you know, strategically, I think the best thing to do is go for the Hittites first. We'll come around the back and flank them. But no, God said, first, I, I've, I've made Canaan. I've made the Holy Ghost. I've placed these cities in chronological order. And first, you've got to defeat Jericho. Why was Jericho so important? Because Jericho was the capital. It was the capital of commerce and supply. Every other city depended upon Jericho. So Joshua says the first thing he does is he closes the, the roads. The Bible says none went in and none went out. So he cuts them off and he starves them. And we know the story how they march around the city seven times and there's a great victory and a great shout and the walls of Jericho come down. And I'm sure as all the rubble comes down and they go marching with the trumpet of the Lord and they're praising God for their victory in the Holy Ghost. And they go marching on Jericho and on the rubble. But one brother, as he's looking at the rubble, he stumbles into a little... little uh, Ruin. And he looks inside the room of what used to be a Canaanite's bedroom. And he sees a Babylonian garment. He sees a wedge of gold. He sees a wedge of silver. And the Bible says that Achan says, and I coveted it. I wonder what was going through this brother's mind. As everyone shouted and everyone has victory. And Achan's, no doubt, no doubt Achan is trying to decipher if anybody's looking and wonder what anybody would say. Now God has already said, cursed be the man who builds upon Jericho. Cursed be the city. It is a banned city. God wants them to destroy it, to destroy it, annihilate it, destroy their pictures. That's what God said. Destroy their molten images, plug down their high places. He even says, take their images and all their photographs of their families and burn them. Don't let there be any existence or any sign or any evidence that there was an existence before you dwelled here. Because what was God saying? This is your property. And the devil has no place on your property. And Achan looks, he's looking around, no doubt. I wonder what was going through his mind as he began to, you know, calculate this and calculate the risk. And the Bible says he covets it and he takes it. And suddenly, chapter 7, we come to, after the thrill of victory was so strong, now it's replaced with the agony of defeat. What a life lesson chapter 6 and chapter 7 is. How that we can live so high on the mountain and in the very next moment we're in the valley of defeat. The distance between great victory and great defeat is only one step. Say it again. The distance between a great victory and spiritual victory and total defeat and failure is often a very small step. Sometimes it's just one choice. Are you with me here tonight? The sad truth and the reality is that the fallen world that you live on is contaminated. It's poisonous. And every time you walk out into this earth and this age that we live in, everything you touch, all your senses, everything that you come in contact with is contaminated and poisonous. That's why you better be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost from your head to your toes. It better saturate your spirit. That's why the Bible says pray without ceasing. Man, that seems a little bit extreme. Pray without ceasing? 
When do we say in Jesus' name, amen? Never. Paul says never. You don't ever say it. You stay in prayer. You stay in an atmosphere. You stay prayed up. You stay with the song Paul said upon your lips and a word, a psalm in your heart. You stay in an atmosphere and a channel. This is overcoming in Canaan. This is how you get victory in the midst of Lady Osea. You stay in another dimension, in another atmosphere as you move through this world. And if you don't, you become contaminated. Just like that. And we feed and we feed and we feed and we live in the age of addiction. More than ever before, we live in an age of addiction. I said, more than ever before. You have things at your fingertips, things right around you, devices everywhere. I don't think it was an accident that even in the old King James English, the Apostle Paul says we are not ignorant of his devices. <laughs> I like that. We are not ignorant of his devices. Unfortunately, some of us are. They are his devices. See this right here? That's his device. And I'm not a dummy. I'm not dumb enough to think that I trust myself. I'm not dumb enough to say like Joshua, oh, you know, we really don't need to be prayed up. We really don't need to be spiritual. It's just a small thing. You better not be ignorant of his devices. <laughs> I love what your pastor said, and so, someone actually told me, he said, I didn't hear him say it. He said, Brother Donnie said, you know, some people are just too stupid to use Facebook. <laughs> Some people are too dumb to be on Facebook. And they shouldn't be. As Brother Burley calls it, to Facebook. <laughs> we are not ignorant of his devices. It's amazing how quickly we can come from victory. It's amazing how quickly we can come from revival and be right on the cloud of a great spiritual success. Or a great spiritual victory in the very next moment we find ourselves in the valley of spiritual failure and despair. One moment we're standing on the mountain of Mount Carmel like Elijah slaying the prophets of Baal. In the next moment Elijah's shriveled up under a juniper tree. Asking God to take his life. Hidden, hiding in the back of a cave somewhere. Saying, I'm the only one left. And now even they're trying to kill me too. Oh, but my brother and my sister don't miss it. God orchestrated AI to come right after Jericho. God made the path or the road. Jericho was a huge victory. It was an important battle, but AI, this little city, was just and as important. Imagine this. They were able to get victory over the impossible. They were able to get victory over the great and grand and big area of their life. They were able to get victory over the unlikely, but they failed and couldn't get victory over the puny little city of Ai. And how many times us as believers were able to get victory over the largest, biggest things? And some of you could testify and say how great of victories God delivered you from some of the most addicting drugs. God delivered you out of the streets of sin. God delivered some of you as alcoholics. Some of you as, uh, turned your back on God, came out of horrible situations. And God's able to give you victory over the biggest things only for the little bitty foxes. To spoil your vine. Ai was a little puny city. Didn't even have walls. They're able to get victory over the largest area of their life, but failure in some of the smallest things. Sounds like me. Sounds like you too. <laughs> Can we be honest here today? 
to get victory over the great and the grand. But these little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things in life that plague us. It's the little things and the little areas and aspects of our life that the devil, the places that we don't think we need to shore up. Like our temper. You know, people say, well, Brother Branham, how do you get more spiritual? That's what they asked him. How do you draw closer to the Lord? And everyone waited for this great, big, mysterious answer. For him to get the chalkboard out and draw three circles. To draw seven mountaintops. To draw this book and quote this scripture over in Revelation. How do you get more spiritual, Brother Branham? Are you gonna, you're going you're gonna to read over here in Revelation 12. You're going to tie that over here with Deuteronomy and Zechariah. Then you're going to listen to the seals. Read four, read four message books. Eight chapters in your Bible. Go to seven church services in a row. Find a revival meeting. And then you'll be more spiritual. And you know what? Every single one of us would have went, okay, 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 got it. But he didn't say that. He said, how do you become more spiritual? Read your Bible and pray. And everyone went. <laughs> Wanted something great. But it's that simple. What Achan shows us as he comes to this place here, look in your Bible in Joshua chapter 7 again. He says here in verse 21, Achan says, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, 50 shekels of weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Achan decides that he's going to seek his own agenda. Achan's behavior shows us that a believer can become very selfish within their self and seek their own ideas, their own plans, and pursue their own dreams in spite of the rest of everybody else. We do this in churches where families stay to themselves and they never become connected to the rest of the body. You are not only damaging the rest of the church, you're damaging yourself. Oh, Lord told me to say it, so we just got to say it. People can become so selfish in their holy huddle. And they can become so disconnected with the rest of the vision of the church. And the rest of the vision, this is why people choose to stream and not come to church. They would rather sit afar and hear the preaching of the word from their couch at home than be connected locally to a body. Why? Because it's harder. It's more of a struggle. It's more of a fight to have brothers and sisters. It's harder. You say, wait a minute, Brother Matt, are you sure you're saying that right? I'm saying it right. It is much harder to be connected to a local body and have brothers and sisters and a pastor and deacons where everybody has differences and idiosyncrasies and their own ideas. It's much harder to live in the church community than it is just to sit at home. And every once in a while, maybe just on Sunday morning, say hi to everybody, get in your car and go. Yep. Much easier to dream in the stream than it is to sit on a church pew. Oh, forgive me. I know there's, I know there's brothers and sisters who have no other option and no, no other choice, and that's perfectly fine. God knows your situation. But sometimes we can become so self-seeking and selfish. And we don't realize that that's a spirit of this Laodicean age to where the Bible says men, people would become lovers of their own self. That they would love themselves so much. 
And it's bad enough that families come disjointed into church and they never connect with the body. But you take that to a smaller scale. A husband can become so selfish within himself that he's not connected to the rest of the family. The wife can become so selfish within herself that she's not connected to the rest of the family and they're seeking their own ideas, their own ambition. And the body's disjointed and the family doesn't work and the family literally lives under the accursed thing. That's what Jericho was. It was a banned city. It was a cursed thing. And do you realize you as a believer can either live under a blessing or a cursing? God gave Israel, Israel two laws. He said you'll live under blessing. And, you'll, and if you do this and this and this, you'll receive blessing. And everyone said hallelujah. But God said hold on a minute. If you do this and this and this, you'll live under cursing. We know it as the law of reaping and sowing. Achan can live so selfishly, not thinking of anybody else but himself. We don't realize sometimes how much we affect other people. Achan's name, his, his behavior creates trouble for everybody else. His name in the Hebrew is, A, is, in the Hebrew is Achan, A-K-A-N. And what it means is trouble. So Joshua says here in verse 24, he says, the Lord is going to bring trouble. What does he, Joshua say to Achan? Why did you bring trouble? Trouble? And because you trouble brought trouble on Israel, God's going to trouble you. And he's going to bury him in the valley of trouble. And though this sin was committed by one person, all of Israel, the entire nation, is going to suffer because of this one person. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 and 16 says, looking diligently, notice this here, looking diligently, do you have that? If you have it, you could put it up. I think I, if you don't, it's okay. Turn there, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Let me hear the rustling of the leaves in your Bibles. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 and verse, fi verse 16. Notice what the scripture says. It says in verse 15 of Hebrews 12, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby... Say it together. Many. A root of bitterness doesn't just affect you. But many become defiled. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many people become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5, your glorifying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Unjudged sin contaminates the entire church. That's why it's so important to preach against sin. Though no one likes you to preach against sin. But it's important. Prophet of God says here, notice this, and I know you've read these before, but let's read them again. He says here in adoption, he says... And there's where the church is failing today. There's where the church is failing today on that walk. Notice this. You have it, brothers, if you put it up in adoption. He says, and there's where the church is failing today on that walk. Do you know 
that even your own behavior can knock somebody else out of getting killed? Your own behavior, your own selfish motives can actually knock someone else who is praying in desperation for healing. And your own unconfessed sin. Notice what the prophet says, your misbehavior of unconfessed sins of you believers can cause this church to bitterly fail. I could not imagine my behavior thinking that my misbehavior caused one of my brothers or sisters to miss their healing. How much greater their salvation. And at the day of judgment, you'll be responsible for every bit of it. Oh, you say, well, now, wait a minute, Brother Branham. Well, that's the truth. Think of it. Think of it. Brother Branham says, that's the truth. Joshua, imagine this. After he crosses over Jordan, God gives him the promised land. And his entire campaign he's fighting, not one person dies. Not one person is wounded. Not one cut. Not even a band-aid, the prophet of God says. There's no medic. There's no hospital. There's no infirmary. The entire army is well and whole. He says God gave them the entire victory. They didn't even have a nurse or a first aid kit or a band-aid. God said the land's yours. Go fight. Think of fighting a, compa- a campaign and there's no Red Cross around at all. There's nobody going to get hurt. They slayed the Amorites. They slayed the Hittites. They slayed the Perizzites. And no one got a wound. No one got a cut. No one got an injury until sin came in the camp. And when Achan took the Babylonian garment and that gold wedge and hid it under his camp, then the next day they lost 16, there was 36 men. Joshua said, stop, stop, wait a minute, there's something wrong. Something's wrong somewhere. We're going to call seven days of fast God. Why, Joshua? Because God made us a promise. There won't be anybody hurt. Our enemies will fall at our feet. But there's something wrong. 36 of my brothers are laying dead. Something's wrong. Something went wrong somewhere. They're my Israelite brothers and they're dead. Brother Branham says, why did they die? Innocent men. Notice you have that, brother, if you go to the next one. He says, why did they die? Innocent men because one man stepped out of line. Joshua says, hold on a minute. Stop for just a moment. Something's wrong. Somebody's dying. Our men, our brothers are dying. We've went wrong somewhere. Isn't it an amazing? Joshua immediately realizes something's taken place that shouldn't have. How quickly do we, when the promises of God don't come to pass, we're the first person to start blaming the deacon, start blaming the pastor, start blaming the minister, start blaming our family. The last thing we do is turn the mirror around and look at ourselves. And go, hold on a minute, maybe sin came into the camp. Why did they die? Because one man stepped out of line. Prophet of God says, further in the kinsman redeemer, as each individual represents the entire Christian nation. Did you know that? You and your behavior in the way you act and what you do, you represent the entire body of Christ. You say, but I'm just a lay member. That doesn't matter. When you take on that name of Christian, you represent Christ and His church. I say, God, let me be a true representative for your kingdom. Let my life be worthy of the gospel. Let my behavior be that that is pleasing to your, lo- to your word, oh God. Don't let any leaven be in my life. Amen. 
You represent the entire body. You should live like that. You should live like gentlemen, like ladies. Don't never do things of the world because the whole eyes of heaven and earth is cast on you to represent that one thing. No matter how weak you are, how little you are, hold your head right because you're a Christian. We should care more about the name of Jesus Christ than we do, my brothers. My sisters, we should care more about who we represent We're so worried all the time about our reputation. We're so worried about all the time about what other people will think. In fact, parents can become so hypocritical that they do things at home and allow things in their own house but keep their children silent and become embarrassed whenever the kids speak of it. Why? So worried about image. Do you realize what you're doing to the mind of that child? that sees how interested you are about your own reputation, but you don't care at all about the name of Jesus Christ. I say we ought to live lives that is worthy of the gospel. How many can say, Lord, let me purge out the leaven out of my life. Let me live a life that is worthy of the gospel. We're so worried about image. So worried about what other people think. But we never give a moment to think, what about the Lord? What does He think? You are what you are when you're in private and no one else is watching. That's who you are. And you can deceive and fool yourself into thinking you're someone else. But who you are when no one else is watching is who you really are. Can you say amen, church? It's who we are. Notice this after Joshua comes to this place in verse chapter 7, verse 6. Notice here in your Bible, chapter, well, cha- chapter 7, verse 6. Notice what he says here. And Joshua ripped his clothes, fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening tide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, Notice this, alas. Wherefore is thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. What's Joshua afraid of? He's afraid of his image. Because they had this fear that had went through Canaan. That's what Caleb comes when he goes and spies out the land. And all the spies say, oh, we're as grasshoppers in their sight. Caleb says, hold on a minute. No, you don't realize their spirit's been taken out of them. They're trembling. They're shaking. They've heard about the God of Israel. And they know that he's real. And they're shaking in their boots. We are more than able. Let's go right now and take the land. And they had this image of a superpower. And now Joshua says, oh no. Now the cat's out of the bag. Now they're going to realize we're just human. Are you with me here? And in this great piety, in this great piety of prayer as we often do in our self-righteousness. Joshua begins to pray, oh Lord, oh God, he says he ripped his, he ripped, it looked real spiritual, you know? It looked real spiritual. He ripped his clothes, he takes the dirt and sprinkles it on his face. You think, oh man, he's really in sorrow. He's really in godly sorrow. No, he wasn't. You know what this shows? This man, this great warrior, this great warrior of the faith, in this low light, this isn't a highlight. (laughs) This is a low light. This isn't a high moment. This isn't a moment to be proud of. This is one of a low light. It's a shameful moment. 
and the life of a mighty warrior and a mighty conqueror. But what is it showing? It's showing the inspiration of the Bible, that this is exactly how the Bible is written, that some of the greatest heroes of faith suffered the greatest failure and embarrassment to the kingdom of God. And notice, God does not erase it. He doesn't withhold it from the Bible, but he puts it right there for you to read it. He takes a man like David and could say, he's a man after my own heart. He's a man, a mighty warrior of David, and I'm sure David would have loved for God just to erase and take those chapters about Bathsheba, take those chapters about murdering Uriah, and say, God, you know, maybe maybe we'll just cover that up and, and don't show that. God says, no, you missed the entire masterpiece, David. You're a man after my own heart, but you're going to suffer failure. You're going to suffer problems. You're going to suffer issues. That's what Canaan is all about. It's about a struggle. He takes a woman like Rahab and he doesn't cover up her past even though her past is buried. Yet we know Rahab was a harlot. In fact, the Bible never refers to her as Sister Rahab or just Rahab. But every time her name is mentioned, she's called Rahab the harlot. Imagine, it sticks. It stays with her. He's going to take a man like Jacob and he's going to show you all the trouble that he had as Jacob. He's going to take a man like Moses, a mighty man like Moses, and he's going to show you him killing an Egyptian. He's going to show you the low lights. He's going to show you the struggle. And what, what is God showing? That he shows the heroes of the faith and he makes sure their blemishes and their scars and their deformities are crystal clear. He isn't going to whitewash them. He isn't going to Photoshop them. He isn't going to take those fat rolls and those arms that are this large and shriek them down to this large and take that triple chin, you know, that quadruple double chin and suck it up and make it just, you know. They take the face and... They take those banana yellow teeth and they whiten them. <laughs> he isn't going to Photoshop them. He isn't going to take the blemishes and the warts. He isn't going to take the hunchback and straighten it up. But God's going to say, I'm going to show their imperfection and show you that even in spite of all their struggle and all their weaknesses, I'm going to give you faith to believe. If God could use them, God can use you. Hallelujah. He's not going to touch up the photo. Actually, he's going to show their humanity and their struggle to show you if God could use them and put them in Hebrews 11 as a hero of the faith, how much more the elected of God. My brother, let me tell you something. Failure is unique to no one. And failure is not the end. In fact, failure most of the time for these men and women was just the beginning of faith. Failure, as the scripture says, in fact, the greatest failures of your life that you have can either be the greatest building block to success or the greatest bondage. It's all in how you respond to failure. Failure is like a testing, as scripture says, I think in 1 Corinthians, that there is no temptation that is taken to you than that which is common to man. That I don't care what you think you face or what you battle and you think no one else has ever battled this in this way and I'm just weird. It's just the devil trying to whisper that to you, brother. Hear the word of God. There is no temptation taking you that that which is common to man. It's all in how we handle failure. It's all in how we respond to the struggle. 
Bible characters, the scriptures, and the heroes. As Brother Branham said, you have to go through the hall of critics before you make it to the hall of fame. And all of these women and all of these men that you find in Hebrews 11, you can scroll through the Bible and find mistake and problem and issue. You say, Brother Matt, did they have problems? Yeah, they had issues. Then what made them different than any other ground? What made them elected? What made them different than any other heathen? The difference was not their failure. The difference was not the fact that they fell. The difference is that they got back up to their feet after they fell. They didn't stay on the ground. Oh, somebody say praise God. The difference was something inside of them would not let them stay on the ground. They learned in a God of second chances. They learned to believe that even after they failed, that God could raise them back up. They believed in a God of second chances. I said they believed in a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and sixth chances. You say, Brother Matt, how much? All the way till God restores you to your original creation that he intended for you to be. You say, I failed him. Then get back up, brother. You say, I've fallen. Then stand back up to your feet. Don't grovel on the ground. God says to Joshua in verse 10, after all his crying and after all his piety and ripping his clothes, God says, Joshua, get up. Notice verse 10. The Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. all in how you respond to your failure. It is not the failure of Hereto, a famous uh, motto from a company, very successful company. You know what their motto was when everyone makes all these pretty mottos of how great they are and how grand they are? Their motto was, we will make mistakes. That was their first line. We will make mistakes. But we realize It is not the mistakes that define us, but how we deal with those mistakes. And brother, your mistake and your failure was not meant for you to define you. Your mistake and your failure was not meant to be your end. It was just the beginning of Canaan and your struggle. And God is saying, get back up, child. Take your sword back up. The devil wants to hold your head in the dirt and keep you in the dust. But you've got to wake up and say, get your hand off of me, devil. I might have failed. I might have made a mistake. But through God, all things are possible. And I'm going to stand back up to my feet. Nothing is accomplished with your face in the dirt. Nothing is accomplished in your groveling. And spreading and sprinkling dirt in your face. Oh, that's what we want to do. That's what we do every time we... Oh, his Brother Jewel says, wowsy, wowsy, woo. <laughs> Oh, poor me. But nothing's accomplished with your face in the dirt. So the Lord says, Joshua, up, get up. Get out of that condition. Get out of that atmosphere of failure. But Lord, we messed up. I know you've messed up, but you've got to conquer AI. And I've got a plan. And I've got a a plan for victory. And it's going to be through great victory and small defeats. It's going to be through success. It's going to be through failure. The point is not your failure. The point is, will you get back up? Can you say like Paul, I forget the things which are behind me. And I press towards the mark of the high calling of Christ. Oh, could you stand to your feet and say, Lord, let me press towards the mark. Let me forget those things which are behind me. Get up, Joshua. Get up. Because you've got a battle to fight. You've got a war to rage, musicians, if you'll come. 
You've got a war to fight. You've got a struggle, and the struggle is real. You've got a struggle to fight. You've got a battle to rage. You've got to be a fervent prayer warrior. You can't just be some haphazard, half-hearted prayer. You've got to have a fervent prayer of a righteous man. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. What is the fight? doesn't mean you always win. Sometimes you get bruised. Sometimes you get punched. Brother Random said it's learning how to keep the punches off of you. That doesn't mean that you're not in a battle. You're in a fight. You're in a war, my brother. And I say like Paul, fight the good fight of faith. And keep the faith. Do you realize this was the testimony of Paul? It wasn't just that he could say, I fought. But he could say, and I kept, I held on to the faith. I held on to faith. I didn't let it go. I didn't let it go like some have let go. I didn't sit on the sideline and, 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 and weep in my troubles and my struggles. But I kept pressing on. I kept fighting. I held on till the storm was over, Brother Hare, if you could sing that. I held on. Bow your heads with me. If you could. You could just play that, brothers and sisters. Brother Branham says, that is the promise. The promised land is to live in this land of the Holy Spirit. That's God's promise for the church. It's to live in the power of the Spirit. A real Christian fights for his position. He has to stand alone, him and God, and he fights every inch of ground. You don't have to baby them. You don't have to baby them like a hotbed plant. They're a Christian. They're rugged. They're a soldier. They fight. Their song is onward, Christian soldiers. Oh, my brother and my sister, with your head bowed, eyes closed, maybe you're here tonight and you could say, Lord, I want to take every inch of ground that you've promised me. I want to fight for every inch of ground. Maybe I've responded to my failure and I've let myself stay on the ground. I've let the devil hold my face in the dirt and hold my face in condemnation. But today, Lord, I want to stand back up to my feet. I want to hear the voice of God. Stand up, Joshua. Stand up. Get up. Get up. You've got to fight. The race is almost over. It's got to be run. No one can take your place. You've got to fight. You've got a war. You've got to struggle. You've got to fight the good fight of faith. I wonder if there'd be someone here with every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you could just raise a hand to the Lord here and say, Lord, give me strength to fight. Maybe, maybe you feel like you've, you're just struggling and you have no strength. You want to say, Lord, strengthen me. Out of my weakness, Lord, would you be made strong? Out of my weakness, Lord, would you be made strong? I'm weak. Uh, Lord, as the song says, I am weak, but thou art strong. I'm weak, Lord. And in my own flesh, I realize there is no good thing. Oh, wretched man, am I? Who shall deliver me out of the body of this death? But I thank God through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There's been given a power and authority. God has given you authority. He's given you power over every demon and every devil in hell that would try to afflict you or your family. God has given you authority, brother. He's given you authority, sister. It may be a struggle, but you've got to take your position as a soldier in the army of the Lord. Maybe you've been in Achan and you just want to confess and say, Lord, maybe I've been selfish in my own objectives in my own life and I've not been connected and I've not realized the suffering that's, that's, been, that's followed it, Lord. Would you forgive me, oh God? Would you forgive me, Lord Jesus, here tonight? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. Oh God, 
Help your children. Help your family, Lord Jesus. We're in a struggle to live. But we believe, Lord Jesus, one day the struggle's going to end. One day the fighting's going to end. Lord, I want to come to that end, that day. I want to be able to say like the Apostle Paul, I fought the good fight of faith. I held on to faith. I didn't cast it aside. I wasn't always victorious. I had, I had blemishes and faults and failures. But God was able to take this weak vessel and this weak clay and He was able to get glory for His own name. I have held the faith. Amen. Give us strength, Lord Jesus. Give us strength, I pray. Go ahead, brother. You ask me how it is that I'm still standing You wonder how I made it through the storm I can't boast of any special power There's no secret, There's no secret. I just held God blessings I can call my own. Many times I wonder if I would make it. While I was wondering, I just kept Because I'm great, not because I'm strong, but I held on. I can tell the things I finally happened. I've got blessings I can call my own. Many times I wonder if I would make it While I was wondering, I just kept holding on I held on till the storm was over Because I'm great, not because I'm strong. I held on till the storm was over. I don't claim to be a hero, and I don't have all the answers. But I held on till the storm. I'm good. 
good Not because I'm great Not because I'm strong But I hear long You ask me how it is That I'm still standing Wonder how I made it through the storm I can't boast of any special powers There's no secret I just held on I held on to the storm Pressing on I'm gonna keep pressing on I keep on pressing on To the higher cause My Lord Little bride You just say, Satan, watch me prove you liar again. I'm gonna keep pressing on, on and on and on, pressing on. I'm gonna keep pressing on to the high. Sing this together. Go ahead, get ahead. I will praise the Lord. Can you do it? Ah.
going to praise him no matter what tomorrow brings or what it has in store here's what I know I'm going to keep praising him I'm going to keep singing I'm going to keep shouting doesn't matter what tomorrow brings I know I will praise the Lord amen God bless you it's been so good to be in the house of the Lord I, I hope the word was a blessing to you amen praise the Lord and we're going to let you go we'll see you in the morning Amen. God bless you, Brother Harry. Keep singing. Let's sing that again. Oh, I will pray.